What up, bros? What up, bros? And welcome to Bro Meets World. But it's Bro Meets World. Your boy Meets World fan cast. I am Siege. I am Tony Curtis. How are you, sir? I am exhausted. I am so exhausted. I've been going nonstop. It's just the beginning. As people have been saying, um, we're recording this early February. January was the longest year. Um, And it's just like my birthday's this month, my anniversary's this month, Valentine's Day's this month. There's a lot going on. It's Black History Month. It's Black History Month. And this Black History Month has been challenging. I'm just going to (laughs) say. They are already things. They always do. (laughs) They always do. Um, Yeah, but I will say in a little, like, a little levity, I went to a friend's comedy show on Sunday. Oh, if it, anyone knows anything about comedy, is a roll of the dice. <laughs> sure. I feel like um, everyone who lives in LA has been to a friend's comedy show, you know, absolutely. one time or another. Um, and th- it was good though. Oh, it was yeah, like it's always good when your friends are good. Sure, sure, sure. What they're supposed to be doing, uh, or like what they want to do. And um, he was one of the only guys. What what I did learn from this is that women are killing comedy, like. Yeah. It, went, it went like boy girl boy girl and most of the women were nailing it like there were like a few who were like hey, you're okay 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 but the men i was like what are we doing i have to be honest <laughs> i think that our time is really coming to a close <laughs> because like if you look at comedy if you look at music if you look at who the top actors are like women are the ones who are the doing the most interesting work right now they're the ones who are setting the trends this feels like the guys are like running to catch up across the board across the board i agree i think someone was saying that like this past grammys um all of the top winners were women all of them so, uh, yeah, because yeah. even the guys who are putting out music, That's anything a... other than like trap and just like. Very good point. Uh, to, to your point. Sorry, we're going on this rant, but I just think it's funny. Um, Justin Timberlake, boo. Um, has been coming His new out. song is boring as fuck, by the way. Well, did you hear that Britney Spears' song with the same title is performing better? And he's 100%. so bad at it. And it's just like, I mean, dude. She had the issue with an apology because she thought people were being too mean to him. And I thought that was funny. I, and here's the thing. I said, I had this conversation with someone. I was like, she is like, I still like Justin. And we're like, we don't have to. Like yeah. you, we want better for you. And we're not going to tell you how to live your life. But we're also not going to just do what you say and include him in our life if we don't want him there. So honestly, that. Seems like a great segue because that's exactly how I felt about a this lot of episode? this episode. Okay, all right. So if you know. had just listened to me, Topanga, you wouldn't <laughs> be in this. <laughs> oh yeah, we're gonna go there because I thought about you specifically. <laughs> oh my god, uh, when we were doing this. Okay, but before we do, as usual, we have a little morning announcements. Um, we got a voicemail from you guys. Yeah, um, we've actually gotten a few, but I'm gonna play the latest one that we have, um, and then we will discuss that. Hi guys, it's Asia here. I wanted to add a quick note on how Cory became an unlikable character uh, in later seasons. At first, he's a very likable character, as we know, and Sean is the actually irritable character. And throughout the show, we see that Cory is in the role of a, some kind of a caregiver to Sean. And I think this is a really big burden on him. And actually, this creates a resentment inside him, uh, which we see in the psychotic episode, actually, in the Dream Fini sequence. And I think that's why, he, uh, as he can't understand himself and uh, focus on himself because of the drama in Sean's life, um, I think he becomes a some kind of a narcissist uh, that tries to uh, like be that is selfish all the time in the later seasons. Whereas Sean is a much more likable character uh, in the end because his needs are actually a little met. Honestly? Wow. Okay, so let's talk about this for a bit. Um, Let's talk about it. I'm here for this theory. Where are you at? Yeah, so just to summarize, the theory is is that Corey is actually 
has built up resentment towards Sean from having to be his primary person, from having to save him from all these things and be there for him constantly to the point where in the psychotic episode where he points, pushes Sean down the elevator, there's she's arguing that there's more to it and that the switch that we see in Corey's behavior from him just kind of being outwardly uh, more of a miserable human being has a lot to do with this resentment that he's built for Sean over the years versus anything else. And honestly... It's very Honestly, interesting. And let's let I mean let's talk about it. That we know they have a codependent relationship. This is something that we talked in like in length on last episode. And then when you consider the fact that Sean does look to Corey for his sense of stability, and even as you were saying last week, he was like Corey was like purposely trying to create distance between him and yep. Sean for his wedding day. And as you pointed out, Sean, like, didn't like that. And I'm not saying, we all know how I feel. I'm very much, like, I have understood that per the writers, Corey and Sean are the main relationship. But that doesn't mean that just like Corey wasn't wearing on Sean, Sean's not wearing on Corey. Yeah. I actually, like, here's the thing. I never thought of it, but I don't, there is enough evidence to support this theory. I, I mean, yeah, I, I think what we're seeing is an attempt to try to figure out what's going on with Corey from an audience perspective, you know, especially going back and listening to Pod Meets World, like we're jumping back and forth between periods <laughs> of the show. So we're seeing Corey be a drastically different person in the early seasons than he is in the later seasons. And, you know, I, I think this fan theory works. I think there's a lot of other stuff at play. Um, you know, we talked about this in one of our Patreon exclusive episodes, but that <laughs> That, like, I really don't think Sean and Corey are even that good of friends. I think that Corey's relationship with Sean is important to Sean because he is the most consistent, but he has not been the best. He's it's yeah. like when you have every person who's ever said, I love you and I'm gonna be here for you, disappear. And Corey, despite being an asshole, is still there. He is he's gonna rock with Corey because Corey's rocking with him. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's a quality of the relationship. It's just the easiest relationship. I mean, I don't disagree. I think a large part of growing up is having to have these tough conversations. Again, something that we'll get into later in this episode. Mm -hmm. But the idea that let's think about it. Sean's parents have left him, and and at some point in time, Sean had to stay with Corey. Um, Corey is trying to establish this relationship with the only girl who honestly has given him attention and Sean just kind of like goes through women um, and then he does get a girlfriend and their relationship in a lot of ways is healthier and better and well even look at it like this from the idea that Corey has always been jealous of sean because yeah. sean is naturally cool sean is easy yeah. with women and the thing that sean's always envied about Corey has been his middle class lifestyle and a stable family but the thing is is that sean gets to participate sean gets yeah. to live at the matthews sean gets to basically be another member of the matthews family Corey doesn't get the benefits yeah. uh so of, of Sean simply by being in close proximity with him the way that Sean does. Correct. And that's what I was going to say. I was like, even when we talked about it, even when um, Corey has a personal family issue come up, i.e. his mother almost dies from giving birth to the baby, shortly after, Sean's father shows up and, like, drops a bigger card. You know, like, it's a yeah. bigger emergency. Sean leaves just out of nowhere. You know, so like there is this thing of like being like, oh, you just feel like you can come and go as you please. We're going to be able to take care of you. And I'm not saying that I couldn't see a world in which Corey is just like passively aggressively being a dick to everyone because he feels like he has no space of his own. I I think that Corey <laughs> has a lot of reasons. I, I, I can't expl get into all the reasons why Corey is the way he is, but I feel like the conversation that we're having is getting close to it. I'll say that. Absolutely. I love that. And well, thank you so much for submitting that. You guys, if you want to leave us a voicemail, you can do so um, at, uh, what is it? Spotify podcast? It's yeah, on our website. It's just uh, our Brummies World website. It's going to take you, basically redirect you to our, our podcaster site where you can leave a voicemail, um, ask a question, get into some of your fan theories, let us know what you think about uh, either the Boy Meets World episodes, the Pod Meets World episodes, or our episodes. We'd be happy to talk to you guys about everything. We're in that bruh boy pod universe. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, make sure that you reach out to us on social media. Uh, 
at Gmail on the voice things, or as we have seen earlier, our YouTube, which you guys have been very active on, and as well as our Patreon, which you guys have equally been surprisingly extremely active on. We appreciate all of your support. Uh, that is our housekeeping for the moment. Are you ready to move on to the Tell Me About It? So ready, bro. Let's move on to the Tell Me About It. I'm waiting on you. Come on, give me what you got. Tell us about it. The newlyweds have come back, but are shocked when they find that they don't have a home and end up eating tuna fish in a crack house alone. I do and always will have problems with the term crack house, specifically when like- Bro, why do you think I threw it in there? (laughs) I threw it in for you. Uh, Well, thank you for that. (laughs) You guys, this is season seven, episode nine, The Honeymoon is Over. Corey and Topanga realize that they are on their own when Sean moves into the girl's apartment and Corey's parents refuse to take them in. Again, kind of last minute, so it was a little bit short and sweet, but that's also the summary. <laughs> first impressions. Um, You know what? I will say this. Before I even do first impressions, I will go back to first first impressions, which is that I remember this episode as a kid. Oh. This episode has always stood out to me as a season seven episode, but like in the best way. Mm -hmm. This episode, I remember watching it as a child and for whatever reason, it stuck with me. And I mean, like it stuck. I remember this episode so well in a lot of ways and in some like some of the minor stuff i forgot but like the lesson the overall lesson of the episode i've been carrying around with me since 1999 yeah (laughs) and i think that that's amazing for this episode and i'm really looking forward to because i feel like um from what i looked into next week's episode is like a part two to this um but i just was amazed at this episode i was amazed at what we brought up what it brings up for discussion i'm really excited to talk about it with you mm-hmm. i don't know like that was my first first impressions uh where are you at um you know i remember watching this episode live i enjoyed it back then i enjoyed it now um you know in terms of like a season seven episode this might be the my favorite in terms of just it being the best written the pacing is really good some fantastic performances from um william russ in this episode um i I think betsy does a great job too like there's just some really solid performances here's the thing there's a lot i can say about this episode but the what i have to say is in support of this episode. It's like (laughs) all of the things that I have problems with with Corey and Topanga are finally catching up to them in a way where it's like, man, it sucks you have to go through this. But just like Alan and Amy, I've been telling y'all. I've been telling y'all. And you did it anyway. (laughs) It's funny that you say this because there is, to me, this episode is very interesting because in some ways I'm team Alan and Amy. And in some ways, I'm like, why did y'all not have this conversation earlier? Yes, you said that being married young is hard, but y'all didn't go into the nitty gritty. You know what I'm saying? I honestly, I I agree. Because there's a moment where Corey's talking to Feeney and I'm just like, I felt very similarly then too, where I was like, Feeney, you didn't really prepare him for some things though. So like- I, I think this is going to be yeah. a good conversation. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so really quickly, before we do anything, I do want to like just run down the roll call because mm-hmm. running down the roll call, we can come back to these characters. We get Marisol Nichols, who plays Kelly, their mm-hmm. neighbor. She is famous for, um, she plays Hermione uh, Lodge in Riverdale, um, oh. which is Veronica's mother. And she also um, was a really big character actor. She was in a lot of things. I can't even name all the things she was in in the 90s. Um, and then we get Erica Dom, Jacqueline Dom, and Nicole Dom as the triplets. Um, and then we get Ted, Tom, and Tim. Uh, I want to say D. Filippio um, as the male twins. Uh, and then, of course, Daniel Jacobs as the baby. I think this is the baby 
This is the this, Jacob this is the exact Stockmobile. kid who shows up as jo- Joshua in like five episodes. Correct, correct. So he was making sure season seven he got all him kids some credit. So. He really did. He was like <laughs> last minute for me to get you guys your side cards. Okay, uh, yeah, right. I love that. <laughs> um, before we even uh, get into anything else, I just want to say that for me, I want to start with the communication breakdown across the board, like across Jesus Christ, the board, Rachel is yes. the worst roommate for communicating I have ever come across because this is now <laughs> the second time that there's been a dispute about who was supposed to be living in this apartment. Like, all of y'all need to talk. All of y'all need to talk. Not just Rachel, though. Angela also is like, ooh. And it's like, wait, you are, again, according to this show, her best friend. Y'all ain't talk about this. Y'all ain't figure this out. The it, three of you yeah. were living in this apartment and helped her get ready and all of a sudden you've moved her stuff you've allowed someone else to come in and move her stuff while she was on her honeymoon y'all just um sean and angela y'all were at the house the other day when they came back let's, you ain't say nothing let's think about this <laughs> their honeymoon was 12 days yes yeah so within the 12 days it almost seems like there was an active plot that alan got together and said everybody Corey and topanga uh Sean, move into the apartment. Don't tell anybody. Even when you come to greet them from their honeymoon, don't give them a heads up until after they're moving their stuff in. Don't tell them. Also, Eric and Jack, you are also going to be dicks to them and move into their dorm without saying anything and then rat them out to the university so they can't live there anymore. It just feels like everyone went out of their way to kind of make this harder for their friends who are clearly in over their head. I agree. Like, it's so funny. I, I didn't think about that. And I kind of think this episode is really well written. But if we could add in, like, the little fact that Alan kind of, like, went and orchestrated this, I think it would elevate it. Because Alan is very steadfast. And he is he does seem to be, like, the leader of the charge of you guys have to do everything on your own. Which is weird to me because I'm like, Why? Like, the, yeah. like, I understand you being like, hey, you can't lean on us, but you are, like, determined from day one. You can't sleep here. You can't leave a bag here. Don't make yourself a sandwich on the way out. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it and is- it's like, it's okay. You know what? Fine, Alan. Be that way. But you didn't think to tell them before they left, like, hey... You're, you guys are leaving for this wedding, your honeymoon. Have you given any thought to where you might live when this whole thing happens? That's it. Because to Amy's point, it's like, well, we can let them stay for like the fucking night, right? Yeah. Because yeah. we're not going to kick them out on the street, right? And Alan's like, no, no, I don't care. And I'm like, you have the room. We know you have the room. So like, why, like, why are you this steadfast? And you let Eric come back. When he, like, when Eric had moved Over out, and over again, they've let Eric come back. So it is weird that, and and to my point, Amy was the one who was like, y'all don't need to be getting married. Feeney was in support. Yeah. Alan was in support. Everybody was like, you guys are getting married. We're so happy for you. The only one who raised concern was Amy. And at the end of the day, Amy was the only one who was like, all right, well, let's see if we can help you figure this out. Well, hold on, hold on, because I feel like we're moving ahead a lot. And I just okay, want to okay, originally okay. come back to this. Uh, when they first come back to Rachel's apartment, when they're coming yeah. in for the first time, Corey is looking through the fridge. He's yeah. upset that they don't have the food he wants. Yeah. He's like saying, I'm going to take a bath. I'm going to do this. There's never a conversation of like, hey, if we're living here, what's the situation? Where Correct. are your guys? Is Like, there's no like... Uh, conversation about space nope. or our boundaries or anything nope. it's just i'm in i'm taking what i want and that's the way it is which i just think is very telling of who Corey is as a person well it is very telling of who Corey is because what i was also going to say is not only does he come in and kind of like demand thing and like making mm-hmm. all this expectations to the point to where it's kind of funny but like later on when sean is like saying oh you know i've taken topanga's room he turns to Topanga and says, don't worry, we'll find you a place to live. Yeah. And Angela's like, uh, you don't live here either. <laughs> <laughs> you don't live here either. Like, that's the thing, is that Corey, it's, it almost takes Corey until the end of the episode to start thinking of him and Topanga as a couple. Ooh, in a lot the of ways. idea of newlyweds just, like, just starting to be like, oh, us. Oh, what we? Are- 
we do it because you're you a speak we French now. now? <laughs> hey, but no, no, like, I, I think that's so important that you that you brought that up because also, like, as much as the grief as I'm giving everyone else, Corey and Topanga also seem to have not had a conversation, and to 100%. the point where Topanga feels almost like. Like, I don't usually try to blame Topanga, but it does feel a little like Topanga's fault to kind of be like, hey, I'm going to bring my husband into this living situation that I haven't spoken about with my roommates. The fact, here's the thing. I, you know, we're, we're giving shit to Alan and Amy off the top and talking about other people. This is 100% on Corey and Topanga. This yeah. really falls on no one else's shoulders. Yes. Yeah. It, their support system probably should have or maybe could have reacted differently. But at the end of the day, Topanga, you're the valedictorian of your high school class. Mm -hmm. You are the smartest person in this room, right? right? So it never occurred to you to have a conversation about where you might live. You were already in the same situation when the girls moved into Jack and Eric's apartment at the beginning and there wasn't this clear communication. So you and Rachel and Angela didn't even learn from that situation that just happened a few weeks ago. So exactly. like, it, it, it just feels like some of this needs to be placed on Corey and Topanga, but for Topanga to look at Corey and go, well, you're my provider, what's going on? I'm just like, I kind of side with Corey. I'm like, both of you guys made this choice together. So this is on, on both of you, really. I agree. Um, it's interesting because we finally get to see, for the longest time, we've had Topanga be the Miss Perfect or, you know, again, her reacting rightfully to, um, you know, the events in her life and the show kind of downplaying them. Mm -hmm. But now that she is linked to Corey, she also has to pay the consequences of Corey's entitlement. And mm -hmm. I do like that they don't give Topanga an out. They're like, nope, you both chose this. Mm -hmm. You both have, like the girls aren't like, hey, Topanga, you can stay here, but Corey can't. Like, they're like, no, no, no. You are getting married. That was something that you wanted to do. So and everyone has married. that attitude. Even the girls are like, y'all don't live here no more. Bye. Yeah, Bye. exactly. Why are you still here? Like everyone has that attitude. I'm like, damn, y'all harsh. Like, <laughs> yeah. give it to them slow. Damn. And to your point, it feels almost like, uh, like I'm gonna bring up a word, but it feels almost Cosby esque in the in the sense yes. of when Cosby used to teach his children lessons mm -hmm. by orchestrating and having everyone play a role like it's like that's... when theo had to pay rent correct Great episode correct but like that's what this reminds me of if if we're going to go with your alan theory yeah like, alan went and told everyone do not give do not like they need to figure this out on their own absolutely um, um one thing i wanted to talk about is uh after they get kicked out of the apartment they go back to Corey's dorm and they're like, well, I guess we'll just live here. And that's when they find Jack and Eric. And again, Jack and Eric are basically like, you know, you can't live here. Student laws say that if you're married, you have to live in the married dorm. And they're like, well, we're not going to tell anybody. And they're like, well, guess what? We already did. Bye. Yeah. yeah. And then it turns out that the reason why they wanted to live there is because apparently triplets have moved into Topanga and Angela's old apartment, which yep. is where I thought. Eric, I mean, where I thought... So here's the thing. Eric and... We know Eric and Jack moved into Topanga and Angela's apartment. That's what we were told previously. And, and, and that the does make... came out of. Well, well, here's the thing. Let's, let's follow this along. Corey and Sean had their dorm. That's where they were staying. Mm -hmm. When the girls moved into Jack's place. So Corey and Sean had their dorm. Then um, Jack and Eric had the girls' old dorm. So that's where everyone, and the girls were all in the apartment. Then what happened was they, Corey and Topanga went on their honeymoon. And while they were on their honeymoon, Sean moved into the girls' apartment. Weird leaving, choice. I would have returned to that, by the way. I want to see where this goes. But that leaves Eric and Jack room to go into another apartment. And I feel like there's some missing storyline of like the triplets being like, we need a place to live in the student unions. And the boys being like, we know of an empty apartment. So we'll give you our apartment. And then Jack being like, what are we gonna, where are we gonna live? And Eric being like, well, if Sean's moving out, we can move in. And like, that's how I see it all working. Again, but of course, a lot like had to happen. Yeah. A lot had to happen off camera in order for that to make sense. The but is that reason... not plausible though? Is that's that possible? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. 
two things I just want to say about this real fast is um, one. Well, I forget my first point. <laughs> the main <laughs> thing I want to say about this, the triplet thing. This yeah. is not the first time we've seen this show being like, oh, the twins are so and so, or Corey, the triplets are doing what cream bikini cuts or whatever. Like, what is with this show fetishizing siblings in Thank this you. way? Because it's kind of weird to me. And even as a kid, I was like, well, they're sisters. What do you think? And they're like, oh, we do everything together. Like, where are you hoping this ends <laughs> for you, bro? Like, yeah, it's a very weird situation. I never, I never like it. I never get it let's put that on the back burner because we got okay that that's our b storyline but i i do want to say and just acknowledge right now i have never i never have and never will understand like the fascination with like being with twins because as you said you can't be with more than one and yeah. even if you are with more than one there are a lot of moral implications going on here that i personally want no part of that's uh -huh. me yeah <laughs> Oh, oh, real fast. I remember the second thing, which is to me, it makes far more sense for the boys to take the apartment back. Boys take the apartment back. Angela and Rachel live in the dorm. Bam, boom, boom. Everything. No, but see, if you do, if you do that, then there is an open space in Sean's room. Do you get where I'm going? No, of course, because they should have never just gotten rid of an apartment that two people were living in. I'm not disagreeing. I'm saying that they did like yeah. they, they did this whole musical cheer. So it would in fact, it it does put sure. all characters in a space to where Corey and Topanga have nowhere else to go. And then they go to Corey's parents, which is like the next game yeah. that we're at. And this is where Alan is just like dead fast, you can't move in here. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think there are a lot of things going on in this scene. One, Corey says, You're lucky I even asked you. Yeah. And that is, again, the entitlement that we're dealing with, where Corey's like, oh, I don't even have to listen to you in your house. Mm -hmm. You're lucky I even asked you. And I was like, if this was a Black show, you would have gotten the backhand. <laughs> yeah. And then you get Corey being like, I'm not asking you, Dad. I'm asking Mom. And then he kind of pits the parents against each other. Yeah. And for a moment, it works because Alan and Amy, who we... Again, we've had like our, our problems with lately, but the idea that Amy and Alan would be so steadfast kind of feels weird because again, as, as Amy was the one who wasn't supportive, it feels like it would make more sense for Amy to be the one who's like, no, yeah. because Alan historically has always advocated for his kids. You know, I have to say, I know the next episode. Very, I don't, very well. So don't, and don't I'm not going to say anything, but I'm saying that I think that painted Alan very differently in my head because I kind of know where his motivations were in this episode. So I think that may have tainted my viewing of it. I was kind of more on his side. But one thing that I thought was really interesting is that Amy and Alan are kind of arguing in front of Corey about this. And then in this particular scene, Amy... And Alan kind of have this moment where Alan's like, hey, they're married, remember? Mm -hmm. Almost as if him and Amy had to have a conversation about like, you know, yeah. how like, hey, this isn't your little boy anymore. And I know yeah. that was a theme for Amy prior. And I, it, I think this is a callback to that. I don't think it was like Alan putting his foot down. It was like, hey, me and you talked about this. We said he, if he's going to get married, he's going to be a big boy now. And he can't just run to us every time he needs it. We agreed to this before. Don't soften now. And I think is where that was going. It's Corey and Topanga, not Corey and us. Yeah. Which I wrote down because I was like, that's very impactful. And that's real. And again, as parents, I do, like, I, I want to make it very clear. In some ways, I'm very supportive of Alan being like, no, you thought you were big. You thought you were grown. Mm -hmm. You you wanted to do this. So you have to take everything that comes with it. I, I am in favor of that. However, I do want to say that, one, we cannot skip over the fact that it is very normal for a lot of cultures for people to live with their parents. I was going to say, I... I remember watching this even as a kid and thinking like, 
wait so this how it, it happens you plan the wedding and then you're homeless and then you have to find a place to live and no one helps you like it just it never really made sense to me and i i mean we're watching this from 2024 where it's far more common that people live together before they're married and that people live at home for far longer times i mean now in this economy people yeah. are living at home in all kinds of ages so like yeah. it, it, it's it's such a different lens but even then i like I felt the culture shock for them, I guess, of just like being like, wow, no one is helping us now. We didn't even get a heads up that it was going to be this hard. Well, we got to talk about white culture because in white culture, it has always been that I've, I've heard some the individual. Kind of, yeah, it's individualistic. It's very much pull yourself, quote unquote, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. It's very much from what I've gathered. And this is there are lots of TikToks that talk about this, but the idea that you are kind of renting your space at your parents place and the moment you turn 18 or the moment you have like any kind of like independence or you're supposed to be in college they kind of kick you out and they're like we've done our job we've done our responsibility it's all on you now mm -hmm. which is different from a lot of other cultures i just went to hassan minhaj concert yeah and he talks about how even married his mother would love for him to move back into his old room mm -hmm. and the idea that in a lot of cultures, you would live with your parents. It is intergenerational living. This is stuff that like, even all in the family, if you want to go there, all sure. in the family has their daughter and her husband living with them. So, and that's a white show, but I'm just saying it's it's also an older show. It's yeah. also this idea of since the 80s, you are supposed to be out and be your own person and contribute to society and become a consumer all on your own. We've got you to 18. Everything after 18 is up to you. Um, I mean, I I, I know we, we already referenced the Cosby show, but I can't help but to laugh about the premise that it's really all about them trying to get their kids out and their kids keep coming home. Like, I mean, that's a really so, good point. Like, that's all they want is to get the kids out of the house. And after a while, they all come back for one reason or another. Yeah. I mean, again, sitcom is one of the reasons, but also just this idea of, yes, you raise them to a certain age, but also you understand the economic, you understand economics in a way that honestly, we've never taught you. Sure. That's one of the things that I say. And like I said, to me, part of this is Alan and Amy didn't have a conversation with Corey. Like, y'all yeah. were willing to throw them a wedding, but y'all weren't willing to be like, this is how you fill out a rental agreement. That's what I mean. Like, there's there's a part of me that agrees with them being like, hey, we have to give them tough love at some point. Both Corey and Topanga say in this episode that this is the worst thing that's ever happened to them. We're and I have to say, yeah. <laughs> like, you need some reality at this point. Yes. But at the same time, to not prepare them ahead of time, to not have conversations, to not like, I, I, I don't know. It just feels like it's, there's one thing to like want to toughen someone up for the harshness of life and then just throwing someone to the wolves without like a knife Correct. to defend themselves. And that kind of felt like what was going on in this episode. It feels a kind of like, to your point, kicking them out the nest and being like, mm. hey, like up, up until you said I do, I, I was involved. But now that you've said I do, our contract has ended. Yeah. And I'm under no obligation to help. And I, I get the tough love. I absolutely do. I want to make that very clear. I'm a tough love parent. I'm a very much like a, you wanted to do this? Let's do this. But also, there is something to be said about grace and about preparing someone for that harsh reality. Yeah. Uh, okay, so one of the things that I also want to point out is um, Amy has that moment where she's like, we can't help you. You know, like her and Alan connect. It's supposed to be Corey and Topanga, not Corey and us. And and Amy's like, I'm sorry. And Topanga's like, I know. And Corey says something along the lines of like, what good are you? And again, it's like, Corey does not really deserve grace, I will admit. Yeah. But... I did think, why did they not ask Topanga's parents? Why did they not ask Topanga's aunt? Like, like, it's not just Corey's responsibility. Let's call on some of these people. Even if you're not going to live with them, let's say, like, you know, we know her uh, parents live in Pittsburgh. If that's the case, mom and dad, can I have money for a hotel room? Can, you know, like, can you help me out a little bit? You were just here. 
Yeah. What what are we doing? You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, I one of the things that really kind of occurred to me uh, right after this scene, they go to the student union and they're discussing the situation. They're like, "Well, how much money do we have?" And it's like, "Well, after the wedding and the you know the honeymoon, we have a uh, seven blenders," and it's like. At no point they're like, oh, we should get a job. We should apply to an apartment. We should take actions to get ourselves out of the situation. It just felt like, well, who's going to help us? And I and I kind of understand that this is the lesson they needed to learn, that not everyone is always going to be there to help them, that eventually you're going to have to Definitely fix your own sink. Yeah. yeah, you know, you're going to have to figure it out. But I just thought it was really funny that neither of them were like, well, the first thing we need to do is figure out how we're going to make money. It's like it's never a conversation. Yeah, it's funny because what we do immediately is we go to gender roles where yes. Topanga's like, all right, provider. And he's like, oh, all of a sudden I'm provider. And it is funny. Like, it's funny when we pick and choose because at this point yeah. in time, even though we've had Topanga kind of play this really wife character for so long. So it does kind of make sense for Topanga as we've known her to be like my provider. But this is when they remember who Topanga is. And they're like, what about equal rights? Yeah. What about us all coming to it, the table? And like picking <laughs> and choosing. Cause like old school Topanga Lawrence would have never, would have never said anything like that. So yeah, yeah it did, it rubbed me the wrong way. Not I understand what they were trying to do, but it just isn't who Topanga is as a character. Anymore. And Anymore, that's something yeah. that's really weird. But I do like the idea of sorry. I I don't like the idea of, but it is interesting that we bring up the fact that they don't know where they're going. They are like, we got to figure out what to do. And then Sean and Angela like run in and they're like, hey, guess what? Debbie Pfefferman, which I was like, okay, what is with the Pfefferman name? Buffy. Is this a yep. family we're supposed to know about? <laughs> like what's going on? But Debbie Pfefferman has shot her husband. And they're like, oh, no. And they're like, no, no, no. It's good news because that means news. there's a vacancy. And you're like, this is what we're dealing with? It's good news because that means there's a vacancy. This is this is kind of like the lack of empathy we're dealing with in this episode. This, this is the portion of the episode where I started asking questions that the show probably didn't want me to ask, such as, why can't they just get an apartment? Well, if they get an apartment, they'll need a job. Wait, but Sean and Angela have an apartment and they don't have a job. So who's paying for those bills? I know Sean doesn't have anyone to pay his bills for him. So like it, I started asking a lot of questions about like, why is this the resort that you're willing to go to for finding a place? Why not just get in the fucking yellow pages? Like open well, up the newspaper, like find something or I look for another dorm. Well, here's the thing. I think it's, and I think what we can argue, let's just assume that dorm is covered in their tuition. Okay. So the idea that, oh, guess what? In a opening has come up in the couple's dorm, you can now go there. I'm like, you still have a solution. Five seconds ago, y'all were on the street. A lot of people don't have anywhere to turn to. You guys have already went from, I got to find a corner to sleep on tonight to I have a roof over my head. It hasn't even been 12 hours and you guys already have new living arrangements. Are they what you want? No. Yeah. But they are more than what you had this morning. And there is an entitlement again of them going to the marriage storms. I have to say this, this episode is weird because it makes it seem like, you are required to struggle your first year of marriage. Yes, 100%. And, and like the commentary of like the marriage dorms being so dingy and so run down and all this other stuff. It's like, wait, this is a university property. Why aren't they taking care of these facilities the same <laughs> as other facilities? Like there were so many questions, like just put them in a rundown apartment building. Like by making it dorms, you, it's too many questions. And, and by the way, dorms were not included in tuition because the Google machine says that the University of Pennsylvania average student had to pay $4,600 for residency in their halls. So cheaper probably than a year of paying for an apartment maybe, but still not included in tuition. Well, here's the thing, again, even if it's not included in tuition, scholarship money. Because again, yeah. I'm just, I'm gonna assume that okay. financial aid is covering, because we've talked about it, they don't have jobs. So school is being paid for by someone. Someone. And we know that 
Topanga and Corey at least have like grades that at least could get them some scholarships. So, and they were already on dorm living. What so would have been was, better is if we find out that Alan and Amy have been paying for Corey's dorm. Yes, and yes. then when he got married, they were like, all right, you said you were an adult, you were on your own. So we stopped paying it. And then when he came back, he didn't have a place. That would make so much more sense than the workaround because of some triplets that won't matter in two weeks. Like, <laughs> I don't disagree. I do, I do not disagree. I want to make it that very clear. I just want to say that even like the, the lesson doesn't change. Mm -hmm. The lesson, yeah, yeah, even like yeah. you said, whether whether it's dorms, whether it's apartments, the idea that marriage is your first married apartment should be dingy, and you should have like like Alan wants them to kind of find out and make it on their own. And I would agree that already you're doing better than most people because you woke up this morning homeless and you were putting your head down in your own space. What I'll also say to that is that um, Corey and Topanga, when they get to this apartment, and I, I don't want to jump for it. There's a lot of things I want to talk about. No, no. Oh, yeah. no. I think it was back in the student union where Corey says to Topanga, like, we're middle class. Yeah. Like, basically, like, we're middle class white kids. I wouldn't feel bad for us. Yeah. There is something about that that I'm kind of thinking as they're walking through the halls of the married dorms where I'm just like, you know what? Y'all y'all deserve this. It's kind of like when Alan um, took Corey to uh, his grand, like to see his grandfather's old workplace. And he was like, touch it, get your hands dirty. Like yeah. you don't have to be so like pristine all the time. Like you kind of get down in the mud a little bit. Try, Alan trying to ground him in a way. And this is kind of reminded me of that as well. Yeah, he says, we're upper middle class homeless college students. The pity factor is low. Yeah. And he's like, if I saw us, I wouldn't feel sorry for us. And I, I, here's the thing, I agree with you in the sense that they are upper middle class college students, college educated students. Again, their housing is being covered. And at the end of the day, Literally, at the end of the day, they have a new place that they can call their own. Yeah. It is not up to their standards of what they're used to. Well, it's not a new place, but it's a place that they could call their own. I I will say, do you remember, I feel like there was a bunch of boomers and Gen Xers when I was growing up who had this mindset of like, oh, your first car should be shitty. You yeah. don't deserve a nice car. Yeah. It's like you have to go through the mud. You have to work your way up to a nice car. But as a child, I remember thinking... Oh, so me being like probably one of the more fragile drivers on the road deserves to have an unreliable vehicle <laughs> like that never made sense to me. And I understand the concept of like, well, you can't just get nice things handed to you. But there's a difference between nice and like practical like you can have things that are practical and cheap there is middle ground for them to have to go to like what they refer to as a crack house is kind of extreme but it's not like i think let's 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 take inventory of the hallway alone you yeah. have someone who's like look i have class in the morning and someone else is like hey look, the baby won't stop crying and these are like real life situations that married couples have to go to. No, you don't see anyone sitting in the hallway smoking a crack pipe. I'm, I'm so glad you said crack. that because <laughs> I feel like just hearing the, what being a student and married, the stress levels that it causes throughout the conversations in the hallways is enough. We don't need to make this look like a haunted house. Like Correct. we can just hear what, these people who already made the decisions that Corey and Topanga made, almost like what their potential futures could be if they're not able to find a way through the stress properly, that is enough. You don't have to make it so over the top. Correct. Even because like I think about the fact that like in that very same segment, we see another couple hear Corey and Topanga arguing. And mm -hmm. it's like, see, are you, are you, is this a crack den? Is your place yeah. a crack room? Or are you two people who are young and under a lot of stress that you've never had to deal with before? Yeah. And that's why you're yelling. That's why you're frustrated. Like, and that's, that, again, that's what I really enjoyed about that segment is that it showed that no, 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 these people are not worse off than you. They're not of a lower class. They are simply 
highly stressed in a situation and system that has given them the bare minimum. And even 100%. that, you're still doing better than a lot of people who woke up this morning unhoused. Um, I, I have a lot to say about the inside of their apartment. But before we do that, I have to talk about the baby Jacobs cameo <laughs> where they run into this child in the hallway and Corey's like, oh, a sweet little boy. And he replies with, I see dead people, which as a child, I remember crying, laughing Absolutely. over that shit. Yes. It was so funny. I think he delivers the line great. Clearly in the epilogue, you can see that they had a few yeah. um, outtakes of them trying to get through it and Danielle just laughing so hard. It's such a great line. Like for that joke, if we're going to make this place seem like it's over the top, like I thought that was a great way to just be like, oh, it's a sitcom. We're going to have fun with it. Um, clearly this kid doesn't see dead people. But anyways, I say all that to say is then we go into the apartment. And when I walked into, they walked into that apartment. You know what I saw? Sean's trailer. They, oh, the wait, table, wait, you, you the fridge, ahead and the I stove. Can't wait. I was like, this is just Sean's old shit, and you guys are making it seem like it's the worst thing possible. And I'm like, this is where Sean grew up. Did he not? Corey, were you not over there? Like, I love what you said, because first of all, I will, like, for those of you who are going to get on us, again, their pod is in season four, and we just saw the trailer. So this is not to the same, like, degraded level as Sean's trailer. This is way worse. However. I do want to say, to your point, you kind of stepped on my next point, which was going to be, why does Corey not talk to Sean about this? Because essentially, all Corey did was move classes. Yeah. He moved down a class, and you would think that he got shot in the leg by Topanga. <laughs> you know, and like, we've like seen Sean be there for Corey because in season four, when Alan quits his job and Sean's trying to teach Corey how to survive as a poor kid, Corey was so worried about what to do. It's like they've been through this before, but now that it comes time for like some practical know with how of just like, okay, how do we spend $20 at the grocery store? Like things that they could, tips they can actually use. Yeah. His friends are nowhere around. Well, you, thank you. You were like literally just right there with me on everything that I want to say next, because the next thing that I was going to say is it kind of makes sense that Corey doesn't have community right now. Because mm. one of the things that helps when you're in this situation is having community. Again, like we were saying, the biggest problem is everyone is like, y'all wanted to be y'all. Y'all wanted to be independent. Y'all wanted to be Corey and Sean. You're Corey and Sean. So since you're Corey and Sean and y'all, uh, Corey and Sean, Corey and Topanga, and since you're Corey and Topanga, that's all you. Everyone's like, you made everything about you. Corey, everything needs to be about you. You want to do everything on your own. You want to be selfish. Well, when the chickens came home to roost, you ain't got nobody but yourself. You weren't thinking about anyone else. And because of that, no one is willing to go the extra mile for you. I could, I, bro, I figured it out. I fucking, I cracked the egg. They went away for 12 days and everyone was better off when they were gone. Now that they're back, no one has any time for their bullshit. And that's what it is. People have got 12 days without them. They're like, oh, we don't have to worry about someone centering themselves in every situation. No, y'all can leave. Y'all don't live here. Bye. Bye. Exactly. Exactly. Like, I think that's real. Like, that that was really important to me. Like, just this idea of, oh, wait a minute. Y'all don't have community because you haven't built community. You have friends and family, but you haven't been nurturing those friends and family lately. They tolerate you at they best. tolerate you at best. And it makes, like, Topanga even went to Eric and was like, how could you do this to your own brother? And Eric's like, you mean the fool who didn't even want me in his wedding? Yeah. And you know, this kind of makes sense as to why they allow Eric to come back home and not Corey, because at least Eric's nice to them. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I do want to say uh, a few things really quickly before we move on from that. One, uh, this is where Kelly Aragon comes in. Sorry, Kelly Aragon comes in, played by Marisol. Um, she plays their neighbor. I was kind of expecting a little bit of a, uh, oh, you have help or, you know, like kind of thing sure. for her. Um, that we had gotten um, earlier, but just the idea of seeing this mom who has a kid and like has to struggle with that again, in a way it's like, it could be worse. Like, I'm not going to lie. I, I'm pretty sure we see this woman 
come back. I think her and the baby circle back in a future episode or two. Um, and I think what it does is a great job of humanizing this place for Corey and Topanga, where it just kind of seems scary. There's kids talking about seeing dead people. <laughs> but here comes this woman who is literally just like, oh, my husband's in med school. Like, I'm doing like a lot of this on my own. I never sleep. We have this baby. It's almost like, hey, look at all this that we bit off that's too much for us to chew newlyweds like yeah. it's a good way for them to kind of see what's what to do what's how to navigate the situation based almost on like what not to do of yeah. the people who are their neighbors absolutely and then we get like like the entire time that we are in the apartment this like guitar music is swelling in the background and i'm like you guys again they are in a part in an apartment that is paid for by the school yeah why are we treating them like they are on skid row like <laughs> it's insanity oh uh, one other thing i wanted to say before we moved on was that um we acknowledged that they got arrested he goes between the wedding yeah. and getting arrested and the honeymoon this is where we're at and but, i just thought that was interesting. but by the way to poke a hole in that so you're telling me you only had three weeks to figure out where you were going to live. No, bro. You guys have been talking about this since you got into high school. You guys should have been talking about this when before you even got into college. It should have been this conversation of just like, okay, so yeah, I'm going to live with Sean for a little bit. And then me and you are going to do this. Yeah. It just, it feels childish. Um, I, we then go to the Feeny class scene, which yes. I love. I there were love two things. this. One, we get Feeny back, which we I get Feeny back, yeah. Important. And it's interesting because what happens is Corey and Topanga are like not with it. And what's crazy well, is well, like if we're talking away, wait, wait, I just want to say we're talking about privilege, and they mm. feel like they feel like no one is giving them a break. I'm like Feeny canceled class. To I give you a heart-to-heart. -heart. Mm -mm. Someone's education is suffering because you were having a personal drama and you don't think that you're getting preferential treatment? Someone had to take out a student loan to pay for the class that got dismissed so that he could focus on y'all's bullshit. Let's, exactly. really talk, let's really have a conversation about privilege. Um, one thing I love that I want to point out about this scene is that I'm pretty sure that this is the very first time in the show's history that we see Ben and Danielle doing a bit together. Yes. Yes, but I was we thinking that. always yeah, yeah. see Ben doing bits with uh, Ryder, but we never see Danielle being able to put on a character or play fun. And here she is, like her hair is disheveled. She's talking like she's Marge Simpson's sisters. Like she, they all just seem so grimy. But it was just so fun to see those two play like that. Because I think uh, maybe the the karaoke episode where they're doing War, where I was just like, man, they like to play together, and we don't get to see that a lot. And I hope that in these wedding marriage post-wedding marriage episodes we get to see them riff and do things like that more i love that you said that because i i literally wrote down the comedy and anger that both ben and danielle are playing is so good it's so fun you're right i didn't notice that it was probably the first time in a while i'll say that we see them get to do a bit together but the idea that topanga has gone down to corey's level yeah. of like self-centeredness and <laughs> i thought it was again I thought it was such great commentary on how once you remove someone's comfort level, all niceties go out. Mm -hmm. She's like, hold them down. Well, I'll search the wallet. <laughs> and I was like, funny, but also very telling that she's just, Topanga is rude. She's like, oh, wait, he's a teacher. He ain't got no money. <laughs> like, yeah. she's in Phoebe's face. It's so interesting that all we had to do was take, her ac take away her access to water pressure and suddenly Topanga isn't this flower child who is forgiving and understanding and thinking about everything. No, it's been a few days of little sleep and having to live in conditions that she's not used to. And yeah. all of a sudden she's ready to like rob an old man. <laughs> I mean, you get hungry enough. Yeah, I'm not disagreeing. I'm just saying it's very interesting. Yeah. That it paints this picture that, oh, all we did was slightly remove their comfort comfort level. And Danielle or Topanga's falling apart. I'm just trying to figure out, like, okay, it, it's one thing to be like, yeah, we used to live in an apartment or dorm, and now we live in this marriage dorm, and it's not as nice. Okay, that's fine. You guys were eating before. What's changed now? Like, 
you guys weren't working before and you had money to eat and now you guys have no money for food like there's just too many like things changing that they're trying to shove into this and it would have just been good to just say something of just like oh and we're so in debt from the wedding or something where it's like we're still paying off this wedding like any money we have coming in is instantly going out just something to explain why they're in such like low positions i agree like to your point or again, maybe because we've we've seen this. Maybe Corey and Topanga again, like maybe they were like on a meal plan in the other dorms, but you can't qualify because you're married now. And, you know, like that. Like yeah. anyone who anyone who has gotten married understands that there are so many like little red tape things, especially in college, where you're like, oh, that was only that only applied to these dorms during these days, but you moved over here, and so therefore yeah. you can no longer qualify, or that's a whole other application that you got to fill out. Uh, you know, like the deadline, the deadline to apply for a marriage credit was last week, and you weren't yeah. here, so you got to wait till next semester. I'm Again, something like that would help <laughs> because we go to the student union, and Sean and Angela are like trying to catch up with them. By the way, Angela still looks yes. phenomenal Amazing. great whatever's <laughs> going on with her hair from last episode she's still doing it the hair person deserves a raise um but then they just talk about like topanga said uh i don't want to talk about plumbing or the fact that some guy got shot in our apartment last week um there might be his salad or his body on the wall i don't know i ate it anyway which again <laughs> showing that whatever's going on in their income situation they can't afford normal food and also our second cannibal joke in the week after last <laughs> week's where eric got eaten alive something's yeah. going on something's well, on the wall to to your point i found it interesting and weird that yeah, there's a little bit of a lack of empathy all around all around because sean is just like hey you guys how's it going it's like do you not see what's going on like you like feeney saw it and he was in their class for like five seconds so i guarantee you you can tell and by the way i'm not saying that they shouldn't ask you i would have liked for him to i would have liked for him to offer to help yeah. or like hey i can help you do this or anything like that because of the conditions that they're in and he does say, what can I do? But I'm just saying, like, you know the level of poverty that they're dealing with, and you've dealt with this before. So I do kind of expect you to at least be like, oh, okay, you want to change the subject? We can change the subject. Yeah. Instead, him and Angela are like, why? What could be wrong? And you're like, what do you mean what could be wrong? <laughs> they just told you in class. You know what I want to say? You just, you're bringing up, Angela and Sean kind of talking to them about their living situation. The episode really skips over a major beat because now Angela and Sean are living together and we had yep. no like conversation about that. They're both terrified of commitment, yet they made this big commitment to live together and we didn't get any background on that. It's literally just not even a B storyline like in this yeah. episode. It just happens. And I feel like we're kind of cheated because these two in particular have such like a rocky relationship with commitment and like, you know, relationships in general. It would have just been really nice to get more of an insight on what was going on there. Yeah, I feel like to, to your point, there is a missing episode between the last episode and this episode where Alan is telling the family, all right, this is what's going to happen with everyone's living situation. Sean and Angela have to be confronted that they're living together. Um, Eric and Jack change apartments. They have this conversation, you know, like- I, I, know, I know what it is. I know what it is. It's they're gone and everyone's like cleaning up, picking up the pieces after the wedding. And then Sean says to Alan or something like that, like, hey, should I- leave Corey's mail with you and then the group of them are talking they're like well where are they going to live is like well i don't want them living with me with i don't want them living with you and alan's like listen guys like they're married now they have to be like you're right there's a missing episode and we that this is our spec script <laughs> <We're gonna write. laughs> um so really quickly i want to say we from there we have like this breakdown where topanga's like is this crying if that's the case i've been crying for three days and i was like hey i do i do feel her in mm -hmm. that moment and her running off, Angela, of course, going, I was like, now you care. But then Corey and Sean having this heart to heart and Sean being like, how can I help? What can I do? And Corey being like, my wife is crying. Like, do you think yeah. that I'm doing good at this? I'm struggling. That's what's going on. And it's not your problem to solve. It's mine. 
And well, what I have to say is a little bit of growth yes. because at the beginning of the episode, it seems like they would have taken help from anyone. Correct. And now we have Sean going, what can I do? And it's almost like Corey's understanding Alan a little bit more to be like, really, there's nothing you can do. Well, you say that because the next scene we go directly to. Well, in his mind, he's like, to Alan. I'm going to talk to someone who I think can help me. <laughs> exactly. He goes to Alan. He's like, hey, like we're in over our heads and it's hard and it's tough. And Alan's like, oh, it is, isn't it? And he's like, yeah, so thank you. Thanks for coming around. He's like, oh, I didn't come around. I'm just saying I understand. Mm -hmm. And like, I think like, uh, I don't know why, but apparently all the TikToks I've been watching have been <laughs> related to this, but someone had a TikTok the other day that was like, understanding where you're coming from does not mean I condone where you're coming from. 100%. It does not mean that I will even tolerate where you're coming from. It just means that I understand where you're at. And this is where Alan's like, it's hard, but you made a choice. We and told y'all it was going to be hard. But see, here's the thing. They didn't. Amy did, which is why I feel like Amy should be having this conversation. I do actually kind of love the imagery of Amy just kind of listening on the stairs. Maybe she's crying, maybe she's not, but you can just tell it's very hard for her to be in this situation. It felt like maybe the most realistic family betrayal I've seen from the Matthews in terms of just a like while. a son and a dad going at it. And like the mom just being like, I don't want to get involved. I don't really want to make things worse or better. Like it just felt very realistic to me. And the shot that, that we get of Amy isn't the wide shot. It's like a close up shot from the stairs. It's like, it's more of a dramatic shot. One that you wouldn't really get when you're filming in front of an audience. And it kind of adds this more like level of cinema to it uh, to the whole scene i think i completely agree i think that for me anyway i would have liked it if amy was the one who was like you can't stay here and then we have alan being like no we talked it over we're aligned you know what i mean like i think like because it's only because amy was the one who was like you're too young to get married and no one else like no one else spoke up and they, they kind of just let her out there. But now that they are married, they play Amy as the supportive mom and Alan as the bad guy. And I would have liked it had they just let Amy be like, nah, I told you when yeah. no one else wanted, I stood alone and I said, this is going to be hard. Well, guess what? Now, because she did it before. She's done it before with Eric. She's done it before with Corey specifically, where she will have these tough conversations and be like, I don't care. It's I would have... Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, I would have loved if we just cut Jack and Eric out of this whole story and then had a scene of Amy and Alan talking by themselves. Yeah. I want to know what their private conversation is about this as to your point, because Amy truly does believe this. We saw yeah. her outwardly say this. Yeah. Why is it that she's not speaking out more? Why is it that she's kind of feeling more inclined to like be there for her baby boy now when that isn't something that we've seen of her? Um, Correct. I, um, I love, I just, I know I said that at the top of the episode, I think William Russ does an incredible acting job in this. I think Ben does a great job in this as well. Everyone's acting is just like really coming through. Um, but Russ is especially just, I think, killed it in the scene. I completely agree. I think that he's believable in his stance and you can tell as, as, as unempathetic as a position they give him, you can tell that it still hurts him to do this. Yeah. It, it, I, it doesn't I, it doesn't feel mean spirited. It feels it feels I have to do this. A hundred percent. To and make you stand on your own two feet. I think that this is the version of Alan that we often remember. I think when Alan was consistently there from episode to episode, especially in season one, like there were times where me and you would be like, oh, Alan actually is a little problematic or Alan actually has some issues. Amy's not really calling him out the way we want him to. But in these moments where he just kind of pops up here and there throughout their adult lives, he really does come in and makes a very large impact with very little scenes. And I think that this is a great example of that in this episode. Yeah, but to your point, I feel like everyone's firing on cylinders. Even Feeney's acting is really funny. Like, we we kind of skipped over it, but, like, the scene where they go to Feeney and they're like, hey, Feeney, you got a big house. <laughs> Can we stay with you? And he's like, short of, short of moving in with me, what else can I do? 
I like that. It would have been funny if he said, well, I let Eric stay in my car for a period of time if you guys want to do that. Like, a joke or something. Yeah, yeah. I, I do like that. And then also, like, this idea of, like, him just being like, all right, I'm a fortune cookie. Yeah. I feel like, you know, like, like I, I thought that was really funny. Uh, okay. Any more you want to say about this A storyline? Because I do. Yeah. The last thing I want to say is that the, the episode ends with Corey coming home very defeated, knowing that he's not going to have any help or any person who's going to get him into paying out of the situation. But what I love about this scene is that despite being defeated, despite literally coming home with no good news, he has a hand-picked flower with him. This is yes. the type of shit I want to see Boy Meets World. I want to see Corey be romantic in whatever facet he's able to. If he has no money, he can at the very least pick a wildflower and hey, I saw this thought of you. The fact that Topanga is like, hey, we have no money, but I made us tuna fish sandwiches. Like, let's do this. Like, and Corey looks genuinely happy to have the sandwich and, you know, says, I love you. Like, this is the part where it's like, oh, okay, Alan, us as viewers can understand that this is something this couple needs to go through in order to move to the next step. And I think that's something that's going to be shown a lot throughout the next few episodes. But I mean, even this ending scene, I think is a nice bow tie, even though we don't really get like a conclusion, I guess, to this whole living situation storyline. Um, it feels like it's a nice bow to, to wrap it on. To your point, it just made me think of Season six, I think it's the first episode where Corey didn't register for classes. It's like one of yep. those early season six mm -hmm. episodes where he doesn't register for classes. No, his, six or three. His six friends three. go back and they've registered for classes for him. Yeah. And maybe it would have been a little bit too much for it to kind of be similar. It's like, oh, you guys missed the deadline or whatever. And, you know, like your friends you didn't do what you needed to do in terms of housing and therefore you're in this situation. Um, but I do think that if you look at it from the perspective of they always do have someone, specifically Corey, going behind and kind of making it better, it does feel so weird and so 180 for everyone to be like, because you got married, all that help goes away. Yeah, it's dropped. It's, your support it, system vanishes the moment you need it and yeah that that's what's weird that's that's the one like like as much as i i love this episode and i love what it has to do and i love the conversations and i love the privilege i love that they acknowledge their privilege and again like even though they are not living in conditions that they want to be living in at the end of the day they have each other and that's the point like you guys got to figure it out together i like that I do feel it's so weird to not give us some kind of framing device where we explain Alan has decided this. Like, we understand subconsciously it's to teach them a lesson, but the fact that, like, everyone else, Feeney, they don't mention Topanga's parents, Jack, Eric, uh, Sean, Angela, Rachel, all of them don't have any sympathy and any don't give any effort to help again for the night it's a yeah. little it's a little weird it's it's not the lesson it's how they teach the lesson that i have the problem with it's it's one thing to just be like hey you guys are gonna be on your own this you're gonna have to navigate this Corey. i understand you're upset but this is the reason why i'm doing what i'm doing a little bit more gentle parenting, I think, would have gone the long way. Absolutely. Okay. So, B storyline. Um, B storyline. Well, again, and here's like it's really small. <laughs> I think it's it's like I liked I, I I liked Will in this episode in terms of like being like I like to count them one two three. like there's three. There's he three was there, very fun. Me. Yeah, he's really fun. But then also I have to call out Maitland gets to act this episode. She's covered up from head to toe. Mm -hmm. She's not sexualized. And even when the boys dismiss her and then and ultimately ruin their own plans, she gets to be like, and they're like, hey, well, if you don't have any plans, do you want to do something? She's like, no, I think I'm going to go home and laugh. And laugh yeah. and laugh. That's three. Like, like, I just, I was like, I liked it. She got to have fun this episode. And I wanted to call that out. Um, 
Also, we see Jack flash his abs just for the sake of getting an audience reaction. Like, what's yeah. going on with this Jack thing? Do they have what? a crush on him? Are they doing this because of network, like, push to, like, get a heartthrob out there? Like, what's happening? Because by making him, like, more of, like, he's so sexy that he can't even be on screen without people, like, wooing at him, it takes away from Eric and Sean. I think it takes away from them a lot, and I think it just makes Eric feel like the goofy best friend to, like, this very attractive man, and I don't think that's how they set out. When they first came in season five and they were meeting each other for the first time, they saw pictures of each other, and they're like, oh, good-looking dude. And, like, it wasn't anything more than that. And now, like, Jack is, like, I think, like, distractingly attractive, and they're almost like pushing it that way. But it's weird because he hasn't really changed that much. Don't get me wrong. It is. But it's like, to me, there seems to have been a change in how they want to sexualize him. Yeah. Like, for some reason, the last few episodes, they got a woo when he lifted his shirt. And they were like, let's do that again. Yeah. Let's do that again. You know what I mean? It's like, yes, he's attractive. But he's not so attractive. I can't focus. He's not so attractive. He's now the main character of the show. Sure. And I, I will say this. It feels like his hair gets a like an inch higher and lighter every single time we see it. But it just what it feels like is like, oh, we finally have something to do with this character. We had no idea what to do with. He's just going to be the hot one. And yeah. that's just kind of what it feels like they're going to like designate Jack as because what else are they doing with this character? Does he have an arc? Did he ever have an arc? He started off wanting to get to know Sean. I moved to Philadelphia to get close to you too. And now it's like you don't even exist. Well, so now he has a boyfriend. Um, <laughs> and him and his boyfriend like to have dinner parties with the triplets across the hall like that's that's it that's all i can see yeah, yeah. um <laughs> uh, i really I did, don't like, have anything else to say about the jack and eric of it i was all. gonna I, say like the whole bit like again you gotta suspend uh belief in order to think that you didn't notice that there were three guys at that table uh when you say hey you but like the idea that there were triplets and they found other triplets and that they go and then it went from having a surplus to having none it's it's not a long bit, and that's why I can applaud it because it's not like. But it's also it. it's like, hey, you guys were being pervy, and you found a group of siblings who seem to be like okay, like <laughs> being like fetishizing the fact that they're identical, to the point where it now shot you in the foot because now they have another group of guys they can incorporate into that fetish they that have you were fetishizing off it's yeah it's like it's so interesting how it was like oh man this like thing that's pervy to us we're gonna benefit from it and the girls were like well no we're gonna benefit from it because it's more pervy for us like <laughs> i and i don't mean the pervy in the bad i'm not trying to kink shame but it's just a very like weird interesting i shouldn't use weird but i don't know siblings being sexual together is weird i, I, don't know I agree saying. i i completely agree with you but i just want to say like even if like again the thing is if you want to take it, like, just look at it objectively. It went from these girls not knowing anyone, finding two, two guys who were really nice to them in their new apartment, and they said that they would find a third. And then not only do they find a third, they find a fourth and a fifth. And it is already implied you these three guys have something in common with us it's not just that they found another guy with two other friends it's that they found another set of triplets and therefore these this pairing is going to work better just off the fact that they have more in common and that's I, the thing that actually connects them i am fascinated by this triplet on triplet couple i want to see this show this reality show of <laughs> three triplets marrying three triplets and then all having like kids who are brother cousins or whatever <laughs> like i i want to see it all uh okay um what is your bra moment for this episode the bra moment of it all yeah yeah i'll say the triplet thing i just yeah for all the reasons i mentioned i, I it's it's a it's kind of a, of all the kinks i think it's one of the stranger ones i guess okay mine is going to be the joy over having a man shot being shot like the oh. <laughs> the fact that we just literally just drive right past it. Like, yeah, she killed him. It's it, and she's got to serve time. So there's a room open. It's like, I feel like there was another way you could have made that joke, um, 
and you know like there could have been expecting anyone. a little bit more coming to america i was expecting like a a, lo- a chalk line of the guy on the floor or something like police tape like they said yeah. that this guy yeah. got shot a week ago but there's no signs of any violent behavior in there it just it was they could have jazzed it up a little bit more probably i, I like that they could have jazzed it up uh feeny lesson what uh is your takeaway for this episode communicate communicate is a good one. my my that's this is my lesson for everything y'all should have been talking about where you were going to live this should not have been a surprise you don't come home from plane and go we're going to go home but not know where home is like this they even like Days before leading up to them leaving, they didn't have a conversation about like, okay, we're going to get back. And like, it just felt all like so many like decisions were made when no one was talking to each other. And I'm just like, y'all just got to talk. Be better. I agree. Uh, The only thing I will add to that is I think the show is trying to paint literally the argument of this episode, but also the way that we end is that as a couple, you have to be able to rely on each other. Yeah, I don't agree that it should only be the two of you. I believe community is really important, but the idea that, hey, you got married, which means that your marriage, which you fought to come first, mm-hmm. has to come first and you have to figure out hardship with your partner. I, I, I like that. You know what? I, I know that is the lesson. There's... It's so circumstantial to this world because as we've mentioned, there's so many um, families, there's so many cultures where you coming home and moving in with your parents would not be a big deal. So like it's it's a lesson that's specific to Corey and Topanga who are in this very specific circumstance with parents who treat them this way. I don't feel like it's as, as universal of a message because Again, this, like we said, it seems like a very like white tradition. Almost. But no, no, the idea that like your partner has to be your partner is. Yeah, like, I'm not. Yeah, again, no, I'm not no, saying... no, you're right. Yeah, I'm. I'm talking more of like the parent uh, kid yeah. relationship of it all. But to your point about just couples needing to lean on each other during relationship, absolutely. I just, yeah. I, I was more so commenting on the parent aspect. Yeah, no, I was just saying that like the hardship is something you have to go through together. Yeah. Where are we now? Mm-hmm. You know, that that that. Uh, was really important to me. Okay, uh, before we move on to our homework, you go, oh wait, we got grades. What grade mm-hmm. are you? I'm gonna give this episode a B plus. Ooh, I like it. I like it. I'm gonna give this episode an A. Not oh, wow. an A plus, not an A minus. I just, I liked this episode. I thought okay. it was well written. I thought it was well paced. I thought we had a lot of really good things to talk about. I'll say this. The pacing of this episode felt great. It didn't feel like, with the exception of like the pool table scene, which again, Eric was still very funny in, the episode moves very quickly and you're kind of on board to figure out like, oh shit. Like, it's almost like a, a, a countdown of just like, well, it's getting dark soon. Where are we going to fall asleep? Like, it adds to the excitement of watching the episode of them, you know, trying to get to where is going to be their final resting place and even though i've seen this episode i honestly didn't remember how it ended so yeah. i and i like the i like the fact that Corey went back to alan yeah and was like hey i'm putting my pride aside and actually like advocate for my wife i'm not doing this for me i'm doing this for my wife sure again i, I think i think it's it's pretty good um yeah and i just want to say this I'll, Almost all of my critiques are about treating these people like they're people and not that this was a show that was put together. I think from your perspective, as an episode, this is a very well-made episode, probably the best of the season, I think, so far. What did I um, say last week? It's like, it it makes sense if you don't think of it as a sitcom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, like, yeah, so I... Um... Yeah, I, I liked this episode, and I think it's an A episode for me. Um, one of the better ones. And again, I, a lesson that has and does, like, speak to me for years. Yeah. So, okay, um, as I was going to say, before we move on to our homework, I just want to let you guys know, we are going to move over to our Pod Meets World reaction, where we talk about episode 405 of Pod Meets World. If you guys want to listen to that, go check out our Patreon. Um, so we're going to take a little break. Talk about that, and then we'll come back into our homework. Okay, we're back. Uh, you guys, it's time for homework. Uh, T, what do you got? You know, for homework this week, I am going to suggest a movie that I saw recently 
Um, it's from 2005. I had never seen this movie before, and it's called Pretty Persuasion. Are you familiar? No. What is Pretty Persuasion? Okay. Bruh. Pretty <laughs> Persuasion is so interesting. This movie came out the same year as Mean Girls, and Mean Girls had always been designated as, like, the modern day Heathers mm -hmm. in terms of just like being this kind of black comedy based in high school about, you know, high school girls. But I feel like pretty persuasion takes the Heathers aspect and amps it up a lot mm -hmm. more. Um, this movie is starring Evan Rachel, Rachel Woods. Um, she is a 15 year old student at a Beverly Hills Academy who accuses her drama teacher of sexual harassment. Mm. But the story is really all about this girl who wants to be an actress and she looks for every attempt in life to practice being an actress. And there's so many like, if you can imagine like all the themes from Heather's and all the themes from like Scream 4, yeah. like kind of combined together. That's what this movie is, is. And it's kind like, it's so interesting. Like, it's at the height of like, you know, the post 9-11 war stuff. So there's like a little bit of that going on. And I, I just, what this has to say about like me too. And just, I, I Beverly, like being a teenager in Hollywood and like what that does to kids who are auditioning for things and then coming to school and like how it plays with their mind. Like I, this movie has like a 30% of Rotten Tomatoes. I was never going to watch it. I saw it and I was actually like super into it. And it just feels like a movie that wasn't appreciated when it first came out that I think it deserves to be like rewatched. And I think it's on Hulu and it's, it's just, it's, uh, Jane Krasowski from yeah. 30 Rock is in it. Um, James Woods is in it, but there's just, um, Evan Rachel Woods just kills it in this movie. So I just, it's called Pretty Persuasion 2005. Um, if you can find it, watch it. It's very, very interesting. Yeah, you're right. It takes that dark comedy, very dark. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> But maybe I'll check it out. You know, I have to admit, I did I did your homework last week. I li I listened to or I watched uh the episode of um the documentary about the We Are the World. Oh uh, I did watch it. So I we watched it the other night. Uh, Love lots it. of things to say. But yeah, no, no. And I'll check this one out. It's you you have intrigued me, sir. I'll give you that. It's the scream forwardness of it that I was like, oh, I think Siege might like this. In terms yeah, of you're right. That like that that motivation of like what it takes like oh I'm gonna be famous and like what I would do to get that fame or what really intrigues me is especially when movies like this have a thirty percent I'm like is it a bad movie or were people just not fucking with the things that it wanted to say that's you know what I mean it. and that's <laughs> why I think it's it's one of the movies I wanted to throw out there because of that thing it has a thirty percent and I think it's undeserving of a thirty percent I think if this movie came out now it would be like in the promising young woman type of category of like really cutting edge satire some uh again i don't know why but for whatever reason tiktok is on my brain tiktok had a uh i saw a tiktok the other day where someone was like intelligence is not just how smart you are but how smart you are in the time you are and what your society values at that time mm -hmm. and it's it is interesting that we constantly talk about things that were ahead of its time and it's not that you weren't good it's that you came out at a time where people didn't want to hear the message and yeah. now like years later you can come out and or someone will watch the same thing and be like oh this is amazing um yeah so I, i'm, I'm sure. there for it i'm very interested okay um my homework will be children of blood and bone by yeah. i think it's tommy odayima odayima mm -hmm. Uh, have you heard about this book? Mm -mm. All right. So Children of Blood and Bone is a fictional universe where kind of like uh, magical history where we have a African uh, tribe who have their own history with magic and it's fantastical. And I just I, I find it very interesting. I, for whatever reason, have really gotten into uh, Black fantasy. Ooh, I'm into that. Black, like 
black, but black magic, uh, magical stories. And they're so interesting to me. They like they are interesting in the ways that they differ. They're interesting in the ways that they com- that they combine. Um, it reminded me a lot of like another one of the books I had talked about, Dread Nation, previously. I haven't done mm-hmm. a book in a while. And so uh, for whatever reason, this book was recommended to me. I started checking it out. It's part of an entire series. And again, I'm reading this being like, why don't we have these like we are yeah. getting percy jackson we are getting lord of the rings but like children of blood and bone this series would be good the stories alone impactful i'm reading it and in my mind all of these things are coming to life and i was like this would just like this one episode where these two characters meet would be the greatest showdown on television ever and i just like uh a few weeks ago Issa Rae talked about the fact that black stories are not given being given their due and yeah bro i don't know if you've heard but inclusion and diversity is so 2020 so yeah. you don't give a shit about that anymore yeah someone was like you care about black lives for one quarter Mm-mm. um yeah. and that's that's how i feel but reading this book reminded me that there's so much great content out there um, that tells our stories. But also, if you were just to get like a magical world that you want to live in, a magical world that has good world building and rules, and like you're trying to figure out which magical power you would get, because like the summary of it, I didn't even really talk about the book, but the summary of it is um, it's kind of like this internal conflict where there are a bunch of magical people in this African country. And of course the king hates magic and has banned it. Of course. Of course. (laughs) But this girl happens across a a scroll to where it reactivates her magic. So this magic didn't exist for the longest. All of a sudden she has magic again. And, you know, the tale of like trying to bring magic back to her people, but then there's internal conflict against the government and her, as we always have been, you know, it's not revolutionary in its concept, but it is revolutionary in its storytelling, in its characters, and just like the ability to create a magical world that each each person, like, sorry, there are like nine different types of magic that you can get, but you don't know which magical power you're going to get until it activates. Mm. Like, even if your whole family was like, one thing you can like turn out to be a healer and you didn't even know it and um no one gets their magic until they're 13 but that was before that was when the gods were listening but the gods had stopped the gods pulled away at a certain point in time and now the gods have decided that magic should come back into the world and it's like this very interesting um discussion of like people's relationship with gods and yeah. the idea is that these gods do exist, but also like for as a black person, you're like, I mean, I don't know that they don't. <laughs> yeah. How magic got how it went away and why it went away and why the gods removed themselves. And so like this idea of like, for all we know, there could be a bunch of like black gods who are just like, oh, we're staying out of it for this time being because y'all ain't do what y'all was supposed to do. And we have like a specific contract and way that we interact with humans. And since you haven't done that, or since all the tools to bring magic back are no longer around, that's it. The connection is gone. And I don't know. It was just really fun for me. Well, I, I enjoyed it. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like something that would be a great project to explore in a series or a film like franchise or whatever i hope i hope we get more stories like this i really do yeah absolutely all right um so uh you guys if you want to tell us what you thought about our homework if you want to tell us what you thought about our episode if you want to check out any of the conversations and participate and leave us a voicemail all of those things reach out to us at brum meets world on all the platforms or you can subscribe to our youtube at brum meets world pod you can join us on our patreon patreon.com slash brum meets world uh you can email us world at gmail.com all of the things you guys we just appreciate you coming back week after week absolutely please <laughs> <laughs> come back i'm I, also can i just say this um you know right now we are in what i kind of think of as like a little marriage arc in the yeah, show yeah. and i said a lot of bullshit about season seven but i do have to say i this marriage arc has been fun it's mm-hmm. given the show i think a little bit of purpose that it was lacking i think that the show kind of strayed too far away from trying to teach episodes uh, lessons every episode and i think returning to like okay now you're married but like learning the next step of what it means to be an adult 
I yeah. think there's a lot to explore. So I'm I'm excited to be where we are right now. Yeah, we talked about this, uh, or if we didn't talk about it, I want to say we were learning again this episode. Yeah, and I think that that's important, and we were learning intergenerationally again. Absolutely, something that's important. So, uh, you guys reach out to us. Um, but until then, as Feeny, the fortune cookie would say, uh, dream, try, and do good. Do some damn good, y'all. Later, Rez. Later, Rez. This episode of Brown Meets World was produced by Siege and edited by Tony Curtis. Brown Meets World is a two free tokens media production. Bye. Bye. When this boy meets world.